Don't know if anybody's getting a personal best, but this speed run of the technician exam is almost done. Welcome to episode 7, where we talk about actually doing radio. We're not covering everything, but we get close. Okay, I have to admit to you, the set for Bad Art with Sam is gone. We're too near Radio Weekend and I need a place to store stuff. This is being done digitally. I mean, doing things digitally means I could write what I want, right? I could write on anything. But this, this is what I choose. Okay, I haven't said it specifically, but let's talk about the parts of a radio station. So this is the quote, radio. There are categories of radio that you need to know. There are radios that can only receive, and they are called receivers. There are radios that only transmit, and they are called transmitters. When you say the word car radio, you're talking about the car radio receiver. All the radios that send the signals that car radios receive are transmitters. But in ham radio, most of our radios receive and transmit. We call these things transceivers, and that's what this radio is. That feed line we talked about a couple videos ago, that's coax. That's right there. It runs from the transmitter to this pole thing here, which is the antenna. It's a ground plane antenna, as we discussed before. This thing here lying on the desk is the microphone. Since we're mostly operating in voice modes, also called phone, we need one of these. If we were operating in Morse code, we'd need a key. One common type is the straight key, which is what people think of when doing Morse. For a dit, press down for a short moment. For a da, press down for a longer one. A more popular type is the electronic paddle key. Move left, it generates das. Move right, it generates dits. And that's what I know about Morse keys. Also notice the antenna tuner here but it's not in use at the moment. Okay, very quickly, let's talk about two ways to talk with radios. The first type is simplex, and this is what we think of when we use HTs, like the radios I open these videos with. In this situation, stations talk one at a time. When one station is transmitting, the other is listening. When the other station talks, the other one is listening. Only one person can talk at a time, but they can use the same frequency. Duplex is the other important mode. In this mode, both radios can talk and listen at the same time. No one actually likes talking on the phone, but when a conversation is happening on one, it's in duplex. Both stations can talk, both stations can listen, simultaneously. In radio, this requires the use of multiple frequencies, with one station listening to the frequency the other is talking on. Alright, the more I talk, the less clear this seems, so just think of simplex as walkie-talkie and duplex as phone call, as a starter. All of that was important because of one of the most important things to a new ham. Repeaters. Okay, we've got two LTs that have their ham radio license and their new radios, but they're far enough away that the line of sight propagation of VHF and UHF makes direct simplex operation impossible. Does that mean they can't talk? No, not necessarily. Imagine a third station set up elsewhere in a duplex mode. This station listens on one frequency and then transmit what it hears simultaneously on a second frequency, usually with amplified power. The two LTs can't hear each other, but they both can hear that third station and it can hear them. So one LT transmits to the repeater on the input frequency and the repeater, well, repeats that signal on the output frequency so the second LT can hear it. The inverse is also true, which means the two LTs can have a conversation even though they are out of range of each other. It is also common for repeaters to be placed in good, high-up locations. When I was growing up in Chicagoland, that meant high-rise buildings. Here, it means mountains. There are repeaters up in the mountains around here that give us very good coverage of the whole Puget Sound area. Repeaters can also connect over the internet via services like Echolink, allowing even longer distance communication. The difference between the input and the output frequency is called the offset. Each band that allows repeaters has different offsets, and you'll want to check your book for that. Repeaters are pretty simple once you understand the context. Okay, let's talk about controlling your station. You've built a station, you've got your antenna, your feed line, and your radio. You're in control of it. It's your station and your license. You are the, the control, control operator. As the control operator, you must supervise all transmissions of your station when it is operating. It is possible to control your station remotely, both via radio and via the internet. The place where the radio is controlled is called the control point, and in this scribble, that's the front of the radio. But let's say we're at the radio tent at Camp Quest Northwest. The camper is operating the radio. Let's pretend there's an invisible third camper here, so we aren't violating the rule of three. As long as I'm there, we can transmit. The camper can use all the privileges I have as an amateur extra operator, but I have to be there supervising. We are using my call sign and 9MII. 
But if I gotta go back on bunk for a while and Becky shows up, Becky is now the control operator. The station's call sign becomes KG7FCH, and the station is limited to transmitting with her general privileges. While the station is under operation in this manner, the rules of ham radio say that both the control operator and the guest operator are responsible for what is transmitted, but the full responsibility ultimately lies with the, the control, control operator. Now, let's say the camper operating the radio is you, you have your brand new license, the invisible camper is still there, but the counselor in the tent isn't a ham. Under those circumstances, the station is operating with your call sign, and we're using your technician privileges. You are the, the control, control operator. This is how we're legally allowed to run the radio tent at Camp Quest Northwest, even though we only have a few hams. It's also worth noting that there's no law against receiving. You can receive any signal you like at the radio tent. Things only become complex when transmitting. All right, time to identify. This is November 9, Michael, India, India. All hams have a call sign, and we're required to identify. We must ID. Well, it, except for one situation. If you are controlling a radio-controlled model car or model plane, identification is not required. That's the only time. In every other situation, stations must ID. How often do we have to ID? Every 10 minutes. It's pretty simple. The ID must include your call sign, and we also have to identify at the end of our transmissions. So let's say you're having a conversation over the radio, in amateur radio parlance that's a QSO, for about 44 minutes. You identify every 10 minutes, and then right at the very end of your conversation. So ultimately, you're identifying five times. Did you notice something odd? You don't have to identify at the beginning. You can just start talking, go for 10 minutes, and then ID and still be legal. Weird, right? It's legal, but it's not exactly good radio practice under a lot of circumstances. Oh yeah, this is part three. In phone conversations, you can speak whatever language is appropriate in amateur radio. I'm often trying to push Becky into having QSOs in Spanish. However, the identification must be in English. If you're using Morse code or some data mode, this obviously does not apply. Okay, so let's pretend there's a bike race. Hams are helping with public safety at the race, and one ham is doing the communication for the first aid tent. In a situation like this, the ham might be given something called a tactical call sign, which is more informative than their amateur radio call sign. That ham might be called first aid station. While this is a call sign and is legal, it does not replace the amateur radio call sign. Every 10 minutes, this ham should identify as, this is November 9, Michael, India, India, first aid station. Wait, that's me. It's also important to note that even test transmissions must be identified. If you want to build a radio and then just transmit to see if it works, you still have to ID. Now let's pretend Becky is using the radio while in Chicago. If we look at her call sign map, we're in zone 9. In order to clarify where Becky is, she can identify as KG7FZH slash W9. This will let other hams know that even if she has a zone 7 call, she's in zone 9. Now, I have a 9 call from when I was a kid in Chicagoland, but I live in Tacoma now. Could I identify as November 9 Mike India India slash Whiskey 7? I could, but it's not a requirement, and frankly, I live here, so I prefer not to. That's a really long call sign. All right, I've been leading up to this, and it's time to talk about it. Often in ham radio, we have to send messages with weak or otherwise bad reception. To assist in understanding, we use something called a phonetic alphabet. You're probably familiar with how it works. I'm pretty sure you've heard someone say, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. If you know what that means, you know how a phonetic alphabet works. Amateur radio uses the NATO standard, and here it is. Let me give you an example of why it's important. All right, listen to this. Hi, this is N9MII, the exam word of ten. Did you catch that? Hard to make out, right? Well, try this. This is N9MII, November 9, Michael, India, India. Name is Sam, Sierra, Alpha, Michael. The word is cat. Charlie, Alpha, Tango, again, Cat, Charlie, Alpha, Tango, over. Even if you only get part of the word, you can figure out what it is and spell out what's being transmitted. Becky and I use it even when we're not on the radio. It's super useful. Okay, folks, it's time to be nice. Let's say you've got an HF station or a weak signal DX VHF or UHF station. How do you find people? You call CQ. Why is it called CQ? Well, let's sound it out slowly and weirdly. CQ. CQ. Seek 
you. I am seeking you. Hello, talk to me, seek you. The way we nominally do it is like this. We listen on the frequency for a while to see if there's a conversation. We ask if the frequency is available. And then if it is, CQ, 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 this is November 9, Michael, India, India. Might do that a couple times. If someone hears me and wants to talk, they might respond with, November 9, Michael, India, India, this is Kilo Golf 7, Foxtrot Zulu Hotel. All right, Becky's asleep, otherwise I'd have her do her part. But yeah, I am not waking her up for this, sorry. So, CQ. That's also the initials for Camp Quest. That's not really a mistake, and for many years, Camp Quest used the Morse code for CQ in its logo. And here's a picture of that, from way back. All right, ham radio is full of shorthand lingo and, like, codes and stuff like that. It's pretty crazy. And here's one of the weirder ones. Q signals. These come from Morse code and created around 1909 in the UK, according to Wikipedia. There's a lot of them. Only a subset of them are in use in ham radio. They are three-letter groups that begin with Q. And there are three you want to pay attention to. QRZ is who is calling me, and you will hear it a lot if you are doing DXing or contesting. And yes, in ham radio, if there is a Z at the end, we tend to say Z because it's easier to understand. QRM is interference. If you have QRM, there's something preventing you from hearing a station well on the radio. QSY is to change frequency. If I'm on the Whiskey 7 Delta Kilo repeater, but I'm close enough to the person I'm talking to for simplex, I might QSY to 146.535, which is the simplex part of two meters. If you understand that, you're ready to take the exam. All right, now for the stuff you can't do. Something I like to do is play music on the radio, but I can't do that here in ham radio. Music is not allowed. In fact, most one-way transmissions aren't allowed except for special circumstances like bulletins. Unsurprisingly, obscene or indecent language is not allowed. Does the FCC define what language is obscene or indecent? Of course not. That would make things easy. Expletives are right out. We're also supposed to avoid controversial topics, but that's one I am not going to unpack in a video like this one. Yeah, sorry. If you hear someone on the air and they're doing stuff that's not allowed, should you transmit over them to prevent them from doing bad stuff? Nope. That's called willful interference, and that's also bad. Don't transmit over someone. It's going to happen accidentally, and that's fine. Learning is part of the hobby. But transmitting over someone intentionally? No good. Crying wolf and pretending there's an emergency when there isn't one is specifically bad, as you might imagine. I mean, that's why we call it crying wolf. Also, no misinformation, don't false identify, for example. Ham radio is amateur radio, which is not professional radio. Professional radio is Saturday morning, so no selling stuff. Except you're allowed to sell your ham radio equipment on the air, as long as it's not what you do professionally. Ham radio swap nets were popular when I was a kid, but these days most of that happens on the internet. Also, no news gathering for professional journalists. They're pretty specific about that for some reason. Let's talk quickly about encryption. Encryption is encoding information to hide its actual meaning. The reason we have Wi-Fi passwords is not only to prevent other people from getting on your network, but it's also to make sure that information going over the air can't be sniffed out by anyone who happens to be nearby. If you're talking to a ham radio satellite, and yes, those exist, and you're trying to control it over the radio, you're allowed to use encryption. This is the only time. Only here, only for space. I don't have to number an order, you know. So let's say there's a repeater in the mountains, and there's a yutz over here shouting expletives into his radio, and all of that is going out of the repeater. Who is responsible? According to the FCC, both stations are, of course. The FCC might make the repeater owners take more direct control over repeater operations, but repeater users are also responsible for proper operation. And while we're on the subject of automatic stuff, let's talk about types of control. If you're sitting in front of a radio using it, that's called local operation. If you're using your radio from some other place over the internet, that's called remote operation. You're still in control of the radio, but you're not sitting right in front of it. Repeaters work via automatic operation. The control operator doesn't necessarily have to be in front of the repeater in order for it to function. There are also digipeaters, which repeat messages, but for the digital modes. These are also automatic operations. Beacons are another example. Okay, let's say I'm having a conversation with Bob here. Kilo Quebec 7 Zulu Zulu. 
not really a call at the moment. I somehow continue to be Sam, November 9, Michael, India, India. Some LT walks up to me and asks me to say hi to Bob. That's called third-party communication. It's totally fine, but of course, there are some rules for it. Most importantly, and specifically for your test, if Bob is actually in a different country, let's say with the call Sierra Quebec 1 Delta November Kilo, the other country needs to have a third-party agreement with the United States in order to pass third-party traffic. If there's no agreement, we can't say hi to Bob. Sad, really. Emergency communications is really important in ham radio. There are two organizations that manage it nationwide. One is ARIES, the Amateur Radio Emergency Services, and it would be nice if I could spell amateur. The other is RACES, the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Services. What is my deal? Why can't I spell amateur? Holy cats. To be a part of these organizations, one must register separately with them, with their qualifications and available equipment. While MCOM is important to ham radio, participation is not a requirement. RACES is actually a special part of the FCC Part 97 rules, specified to provide civil defense communications to local, state, and federal government emergency management agencies during national emergencies. And boy howdy, that sounds like a test question, doesn't it? Also, one guess when they implemented that stuff, Tovarish. All right, so let's say you're about to be hit by an asteroid. You need help, but the only radio you have works on a band you don't have privileges on. Don't worry. If life is in immediate danger, you are authorized to use any equipment available to you. In fact, the phrase is the immediate safety of human life and immediate protection of property. If things are bad wrong and you need to communicate, do what you have to. Once the threat is over, the FCC says stick to the rules. No surprise there. In emergency communications, most of what hams do is pass messages between organizations and people who are aiding in that emergency. As you might imagine, it is extremely important to pass these messages accurately. There is a difference between 20 tons of food and 200 tons of food, and without attention to accuracy, we might send supplies to the wrong place. Many message passing systems are formalized with an actual form that contains a preamble. This preamble will contain things like an index number, the importance of the message, time and date, that sort of thing. It will often contain a check number, which is the number of words in the actual message. Sometimes in ham radio, we have a whole bunch of people talking together. We call these on-air meetings nets, and they vary widely in purpose and formality. Some of them are just for fun, some are for maritime coordination, and some of them are for emergency and severe weather communications. Formalized messages are referred to as traffic. If you have important information for the members of your net, you've got traffic. Also, how is this big group managed? How is this not chaos? With a net control station. Net control will manage who talks and when. It is important not to transmit on a net unless the net control tells you to. The exception to this, as always, is an emergency. If you have emergency traffic, break in immediately. All right, we're at the end of our YouTube journey. If you manage to remember what's in this video series, you stand a good chance of passing this test. Please remember that we'll be covering all of this and more during Radio Weekend. There's a lot I didn't cover. Specifically, I didn't cover safety very much at all. You are all unsafe. <laughs> unsafe hams. Okay, more seriously, we cover the safety end of ham radio pretty extensively at camp, and we will be talking about it a lot this weekend, so you are covered. Radio Weekend is a few hours away, and this is the end of the YouTube series. I am once again asking you to try the test exam, relax, and get ready. 73, my friends. No one really knows why it's called ham radio, and I will see you soon.